Hi everyone, one, one more thing. thing. Time Tano here, the internet's sniffliest music nerd. And it's time for a review of the uh, classic album from <laughs> Daft Punk, Discovery. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, I am filming and recording this review at the time of Classics Week. So uh, th this is a classic review. Let's go. This is the 2001 album from the legendary French electronic music duo Daft Punk, aka Thomas Bangalter and Guy Manuel de Homem Cristo. Discovery was the duo's second record, and you could say that much of the music world was sitting, waiting to see what Thomas and Guy would do with this record, considering they had just proven themselves to be one of the newest, hottest things in dance music with their last record, thanks to major singles like Da Funk and Around the World, which by the 2000s had far outlasted a lot of the house music trends that those tracks rode in on. Now, by 2001, dance music hadn't dissipated, in fact, it kind of expanded, especially thanks to the vast improvements in music recording technology in the 2000s. I mean, for frame of reference, the 90s, for the most part, were one major electronic music phenomenon after another. And the decade really saved some of the biggest and the best for last. I mean, we had Moby's Play, Cher's Believe, uh, also Fatboy Slim, Eurodance, this decade also being the creative peak for IDM as well. And some of the biggest dance music hits and albums of the early 2000s were being recorded by the likes of Madonna, Basement Jax, Enrique Iglesias, Kylie Minogue, Crystal Method, The Chemical Brothers, Nelly Furtado, let's not forget Sono as, as much as I would like to. Let's also not forget the deluge of remix CDs many artists came out with around this time, many of which would feature Thunderpuss remixes. <sighs> and did I say Jamiroquai? I, I think I said Jamiroquai. Also, several years down the road, James Murphy would be singing about Daft Punk playing at his house, and uh, Gorillaz would be releasing Demon Days, which, in my opinion, is a record that is pretty fantastically inspired by the smooth, driving grooves of Daft Punk's music. I mean, the song Dare off this record does sample Revolution 909 from Daft Punk's homework. Now, while Daft Punk's discovery is not the last great house album. It almost serendipitously sits at the end of an era where numerous shades of electronic music had this massive breakthrough into the public consciousness. House and Chicago House and Techno and Jungle, Breakbeat, Big Beat, friggin' drum and bass, drill and bass, all of which are groundbreaking, all of which are great. But Guy and Thomas were kind of presented with a unique opportunity with this record, because a lot of the electronic dance music artists on the more mainstream side of things weren't always writing music for an album audience. There was just as much emphasis, if not more, probably more, on the single or the remix than the album itself, which is really not surprising. That's mostly how electronic dance music is marketed today, but that's still a major reason as to why Discovery stands out as an artistic statement in electronic music today. That not only Guy and Thomas groomed this thing to flow like a well-crafted pop or rock record, but also that Daft Punk introduced this massive element of showmanship in their music by bringing on the iconic robot helmets and suits that we know them for today. Also, a couple of years down the road, I guess in an effort to creatively give the record a second wind, Daft Punk came out with the animated film Interstellar 5555. The thing was about the length of the album itself. The budget was $4 million. It was inspired by Japanese anime, and the production was overseen by anime and manga artist Liji Matsumoto. The visuals locked up really nicely with the pacing of the record, and even though there's not really any dialogue on this thing, uh, the, the storyline's pretty clear, like a bit of a commentary on the music industry itself, with the story basically being about the abduction and exploitation of this alien pop band. And the movie might also be a bit of an acknowledgement of Daft Punk's transformation themselves into, I guess, a final form of sorts. While this was not Daft Punk's first foray into film, it was certainly more interesting, aesthetically pleasing, and cohesive than a story about dogs, androids, firemen, and tomatoes. Like, look at that makeup. Look at that friggin' dog. Ugh. <laughs> it looks like a bad 80s movie. So I've established that Discovery had a lot going for it in terms of showmanship, in terms of context, in terms of visuals and promotion, but the album's music was and still remains its greatest asset. Now, while this record is not a total departure from the Chicago House sound that put the duo on the map with their first record, it is a change of pace. They kind of expand or vary their style a bit to include the shades of pop and disco and funk that inspired them in the first place, but they kind of encased it in this sleek, 
futurist robotic veneer. So in other words, give audiences what you already know they like, especially if it's something that you think they might be nostalgic for, and then present it in a way where it feels brand new. So new that it's like a glimpse of something that hasn't even happened yet. Now, not all critics saw the genius of this record upon its initial release. Uh, the Guardian, I think, spanked it with two stars. Um, Village Voice gave it a C. Pitchfork's infamous 6.4 review seemed more offhanded than engaged. And I get it, Daft Punk's very repetitive and hip-driven formula on this record probably did not speak to rockist sentiments at the time very well. And even some listeners who enjoyed this thing maybe didn't even get just how studied and experienced the music on this record was. But Discovery, at least to my ears at the time, was very obviously not your average commercial, generic, soon-to-be-forgotten dance music product. Sure, maybe One More Time may have had a, a somewhat incessant vocal line, but the flawless grooves and dreamy horn loops and gummy bass lines are just out of this world. Calling on them for being too repetitive for the first leg of a mere five-minute song is, I don't know, kind of like saying that James Brown live recordings are too repetitive, especially considering the dramatic vocal breakdown in the middle of the track and the fantastic buildup that takes off from there. And the auto-tune vocals on this thing are really nice. They kind of give the, the track the slightly robotic feel that Daft Punk typically bring to a track now, as as is their style, as is their calling card. Romanthony's singing on the track is really good, but it sounds even cooler with the autotune on it as his singing sort of makes these hard digital transitions from one note to the next as his vocals ascend and descend. This is part dance song, part pop odyssey. And Daft Punk's inspiration to do this wasn't completely without precedent. Think back to the great disco records that inspired the duo. Disco, or at least the best disco, Go, wasn't all just throttle. Look at ABBA, for example. With a lot of ABBA's best tracks, you didn't just have a dance groove, you had a narrative, you had an element of drama, grand instrumental presentation. I think Daft Punk was very much on the same tip when you have a track on here like Aerodynamic, which eventually breaks down at some point to bring in these squawky nat note guitar arpeggios that uh, build up into a great final piece of the song. Or on Superheroes, whose vocal samples kind of break down eventually to introduce these really sleek, very cool robotic synth arpeggios and some uh, very intergalactic lead melodies. Also the moody chord progressions that are introduced all of a sudden that break up the, the raw, irresistible funk of the synth funk and electro funk grooves on the track Short Circuit. And even when Daft Punk doesn't work in a grand instrumental shift in a particular track, a lot of these cuts last about three minutes and change. These are bite-sized tunes. The duo was clearly crafting songs for the ear of an album listening audience and somehow kept these tracks at a pop music listener's attention span. The track list on this thing also features the groundbreaking single, Harder, Better, Faster, Stronger. One of the duo's most iconic tracks ever, and for good reason. The springy bass lines, the creative sample chopping and layering, all the incredibly colorful shots of guitar and synths. But the most memorable element of this track has to be the instantly catchy and memorable robotic lead vocals. Work it harder, make it better. Do it faster, makes us stronger. Maybe if you look at the lyrics on a piece of paper, they don't look like much, but hearing them paired up with the timbre of the vocals, the effects, the manipulations, together with the melodies, it's just such an amazing and memorable mantra. And the structure of this track is fantastic. It's just like an on the edge of your seat dance-gasm with each bar so finely crafted and edited to make each section of the song unique. It's far from just your average copy and paste job, job, job. And also, I cannot do a review of this record without at least mentioning for a bit the duo's grand romantic statement, Something About Us. The sweet keyboards on this thing, the sensual bass grooves, the very cute, quaint, wah-wah lead melodies. They deliver this serene but funky foundation for what sounds like some incredibly intimate robotic lead vocals. Daft Punk also works in a love angle on the much poppier and peppier digital love, which musically and vocally I think has always had some pretty obvious similarities to uh, the Buggles, new wave hit uh, video killed the radio star. But nearly every track on this thing has its own 
style, its own flavor, its own direction, giving this track list a very versatile flow. The song Night Vision is a very nice interlude point on the album. The song Veritas Quo seems pulled right out of the Giorgio Moroder playbook. It sounds like part 80s sci-fi soundtrack, part 70s electro disco hit. And in a lot of ways, the song Face to Face brings back a lot of the punchy beats and, and clunky sample edits and chops that made the duo's first record so great, except this time it's a bit more refined, a bit more cleanly put together, a bit more detailed, and has a great lead vocalist on it too. The 10 minute song Too Long that finishes the entire album off is, is really the only track that you could probably say goes a little long. Although my main critique of it has to be that the lead vocals on the cut are a little too human in tone, like they could have been manipulated or changed up a little bit in some way to kind of give it that Daft Punk feel. Still though, the intro builds a nice tension, there's a nice change up at the middle point of the track, the ending is pretty climactic. All in all, the album just ends as strong as it finishes, and uh, just goddamn, what a great electronic music record, what a great dance album, a dance album really for the ages. A dance album that's so good, like, even so many years down the road, it still doesn't even really sound out of date. There's probably numerous places where you could work many songs off of this thing into a DJ set, and they'll still go over really well. So, classic record, incredible record. The production, the sounds, the ambition, the grooves, the cutting edge aesthetic, so well put together, and still stellar to this day, and, and most likely for many days to come, Daft Punk Discovery. Tran, Zition, have you given this album a listen? Why is it so cold out? Why is there so much snow? I hate it. I want it to be warm. I want to go outside and enjoy the sunlight. <laughs> Over here next to my head is another review that you should check out or click on the link to subscribe to the channel. We will see you guys in the next one, Daft Punk Discovery Forever.